Hello everybody, my name is uh, Giovanni Baio and giving a talk about writing a Nintendo 64 emulator in Rust. Before you raise your expectation too much, the emulator is still in the early stage, so there are like no games playable or something like that. I'm still working on the innards, so I will just give you an idea of what the point where I am and what I'm doing to do the emulation, but there is almost nothing working. I will show you actually something in a demo, but uh, it's still very preliminary. Uh, just a few words on myself. Um, I'm the city of Develer, who's uh, the company that organized this conference. Uh, I'm one of the founders of the Italian Python Association, which is where basically the whole uh, love between Develer and technical conferences began back in 2005. Um, that is my uh, language, programming language history, excluding the languages that I just, you know, skim through, just to have a quick idea. Um, so these are the ones where I actually wrote more than, I don't know, 10,000 lines of code. Sometimes much more than that, of course. Um, I'm pretty, you know, into open source world optimization compilers and bad and system programming. And this is why I also like emulators because they fit this kind of category. Uh, I've been a main contributor for like many years, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, um, back when it was still called MAME. And um, I totally, I think I wrote around 10 or something more emulators for different video games. This is one of my passions and it's also like a way that I like to learn like new frameworks or new technologies, like a new programming language. Um, so um, it's uh, very hard to give a talk on emulators that you know everybody can understand everything because there are, li it's a large spectrum between how video games work uh, back into maybe Rust internals on how to make things go fast. Uh, so I will try to, you know, give uh, a shot here and shot there. So we'll try to explain how video games work, how emulators work, and at the same time give you some Rust uh, uh, technical details here and there so that maybe experienced users can see how I solved, try to solve some problems. So let's start from video games. Just a quick refresh on how video games work. Uh, this is Pac-Man. I think it's uh, like a well-known video game back from the 80s. Um, so like uh, if you if you tried to program in the 80s uh, you had like this one this game is like a 2 megahertz cpu 2 megahertz means that it's extremely slow and it means that it cannot basically draw the graphics by itself like you would expect from a pc right now uh, so uh, the, what the video games did that they had a lot of custom hardware including graphic accelerators back in the 80s they're pretty different from today's gpus which are kind of general purpose but they were still uh, gpus in a way they were graphic accelerators hardware based so this is for instance a picture of uh, of a board of a pacman actual real pacman board if you open the pacman game this is the uh, the board as you can see compared to today uh, where basically now hardware design try to cram everything into a big uh, system on chip with everything inside for thermal purposes and everything in this case you had like hundreds of you know small uh, chips um, and components uh, and like if you actually look at it or if you download the high-res pictures, you can identify components by looking at the name. So you can see the Z80 CPU and the ROMs that contain the actual game code. Um, so basically, uh, a, hardware, um, a hardware console or a hardware platform for video games is usually made of several different uh, hardware components that you know, work together in parallel at the same time. Like you can have one or more CPUs, one or more GPUs, uh, audio uh, hardware, crypto hardware, DMA hardware, and so on. And then different kind of memories. Like you can have uh, RAM, video RAM, sound RAM, different ROMs, and so on. Uh, this is quite different from the PC architecture which are we are used to, where basically everything is like you have this big CPU thing, and then you have this big RAM available, and then maybe now the GPU and the video RAM, but you know you could do many things with just the CPU and the RAM. Uh, back uh, like in the 80s and all the video games hardware, you had to basically program many different chips to uh, achieve your results. Um, so for instance, you could have like, I don't know, maybe the CPU one is the main CPU that through a bus can, you know, command both the 3D and 2D GPU and access a bank of RAM. And then maybe you have a different CPU that can access uh, another subset of those components. They are not really orthogonal in a way. 
Um, so how do you basically emulate these? Well, um, if you think of it, these are all different chips that work in parallel. They have a frequency and they go through you know, their task uh, at a certain speed. So for instance, I think everybody is familiar with how a CPU works. Basically, they fetch one of code from RAM, they execute it, and then go to the next one. And so they have you know, a task list in a way, which is just run this program, and they go through it at a certain pace, which is given by its frequency, right? Uh, and the GPU is actually similar. They have uh, a, a task, uh, a, um, a list of uh, operations that they need to perform. They sometimes they call display list or something like that, which is a list of commands that they need to perform, and they go through it again at a certain pace. Uh, audio is the same. They basically fetch audio samples and convert them with the, um, to analog um, signal at a certain pace, maybe the pace is, I don't know, 44 kilohertz per sample or something like that. Um, DMA is copying memory at a certain speed, and all these components are working in parallel. So maybe everything starts from the CPU, the main one or one of the CPUs that gives command, maybe prepare a display list and send it to the GPU, and then the GPU starts in parallel at its own speed to process the, the commands. So basically you have many different, uh, you know, uh, cores, that works in parallel. So uh, many people, when, when they are describe this architecture, they say, okay, we can use like multi-threading for this, right? So one thread, one system thread per, per uh, hardware component, which, I mean, would make sense from a pur purely theoretical point of view, but the problem is that you require actually perfect syncing between the, all these items because they need to absolutely emulate uh, each, each one at its own speed. Uh, with the system threads, you don't get this. You basically have the OS scheduler that run all your threads. You have no idea of the speed of each on of uh, each thread, and so basically you cannot, you know, sync between them accurately. So um, basically, forget about threads. Uh, the only way is to basically, you know, go through each of them by yourself with a fixed time slice, and this is how emulators do. So let's say that we decided the time slice of emulation is uh, one frame, which is uh, one uh, sixth, sixtieth of a second. Um, so what you do is that, okay, I emulate uh, uh, one sixtieth of a second of a CPU. And how do I do that? Well, if the CPU one is uh, 66 megahertz, it means that it uh, executes 66 million instruction per second. So one sixtieth of that is one, one point, sorry, one million, one, thousand instructions, uh, 100,000 instructions, sorry. Uh, and so you just, you know, you run your CPU emulation and you, you basically say, okay, I want to run this for exactly one million instructions. And the emulator goes, so you can see, you know, you go through all the instructions and emulate it. Then you go to CPU2 and, and do the same. And then you go to the GPU and do the same. You emulate one display list worth for a frame and so on. And when everything uh, has been emulated, you continue to the, to the second frame. So you basically, you know, you're kind of doing a scheduler in a way. You're just switching between different emulations, different chips, uh, uh, keeping your pace yourself. Um, this is an example where we, we are emulating one frame at a time of each subsystem. Usually you cannot do that. Uh, you need uh, a more granular uh, switching, so more faster switching between subsystems. Um, older games used to do, sorry, used to do raster effects like this one. Um, when you see this one, like uh, back in the day, uh, it's basically some special effects. Uh, can you see it? It's basically, you know, like um, uh, the, the image is, uh, the is uh, it's got a horizontal distortion across the screen. And the way the, the video game hardware were doing this, were basically changing the screen offset uh, every line. You know, so the image was drawn as flat, but then every line the CPU was changing the screen offset. So it was, you know, simulating this effect. And so to do this, you need to be able to make sure that you change the CPU will change the screen offset, and then the GPU will realize that the screen offset is changed and drawn accordingly. And to do this, you need to basically interleave much more than one frame at a time. So usually emulator interleave one line of screen at a time, which is really much more often. It means that you, can, you must basically switch between each subsystem 
uh, tens of thousands of times each second. Okay, just, this is just a primer on uh, how emulators work. Uh, let's focus on N64. Uh, so, uh, if you open an N64, what do you find inside? Uh, well, the main CPU uh, was a MIPS uh, R4300 CPU. Uh, this one is, was a 64-bit CPU. Uh, Nintendo 64 was uh, released in uh, 1995. So it was actually one of the first production hardware with 64 CPUs back in the day. Uh, it w actually was, um, the memory bus was still uh, 32 bits, uh, but the registers in the CPU were 64 bits. So you could still do 64 bits calculation, but then you have a 32 bit access to the memory. Um, the, the frequency was about 200 megahertz. Uh, it's got a F FPU unit. Uh, a very small L1 cache, and we can see that it's going to be a problem. It uh, was actually one of the main problems of the console. And it was also a big Endian architecture. Uh, we all love big Endian when we write emulators because it means everything you do needs to be reversed uh, in memory, and it's always a big mess. Um, it's got about four megabytes of RAM and, uh, and the ROM cartridge. You know, Nintendo 64 had uh, ROM cartridge like this one. Uh, which are basically connected with the bus uh, at a decent speed, actually half of the RAM. So it's basically you had the whole the game code and graphics available basically at uh, RAM speed, uh, which meant that you know loading time were zero compared to PlayStation One back at the time where you had you know to wait for the game to load from from the CD. Uh, loading time was zero, but but also uh, the available memory was uh, really small because I think the biggest cartridge was uh, 64 megabytes. Uh, when you compare it to a standard CD-ROM, or like uh, the one in the PS1, PlayStation, was about uh, 650 megabytes. So it was 10 times more space available in a sing for a single game. Um, and then uh, here we are missing the graphic hardware, right? And so the graphic hardware was actually the gem of this console because it was like a, a system on chip designed by Silicon Graphics. Uh, actually, it was an attempt of Silicon Graphics to enter the consumer market because they were just doing, you know, B2B stuff, big uh, workstations uh, for um, large projects, and they wanted to enter the consumer market. And they decided to say, okay, uh, we are a graphics company, we want to enter the consumer market, let's do like a GPU, some technology for video games hardware, and let's find a partner. So they went to Sega first, and Sega said, no, I don't like this, uh, go away. And then they went to Nintendo, and Nintendo said, oh, it's great, let's make a console together. And so they partnered with Silicon Graphics to make the, the N64. And Silicon Graphics, you know, was pretty, nice, was pretty advanced about graphics. They already started, uh, they had already started back at the time OpenGL development. OpenGL first version was released in uh, 1990 or 1991, something like that. And, the, mm, and they would started designing the console across that date. So if you, s if you download nowadays the original software development kit to write games on the Nintendo 64, you had an API which is very similar to OpenGL. It was not really OpenGL, but it looked like it. It was really inspired by it because it was designed by Silicon Graphics. So basically it was the same uh, uh, designer. Um, and this system on chips include uh, one MIPS core, with uh, a SIMD vector unit, which is also very advanced for 1995, right? Mm, we, we also got a SIMD vector. We got MMX with Pentium around 1995, but this, this guy is actually more powerful than uh, an SSE2. It's between SSE2 and SSE4, which means uh, like 10 years before PC technology went there. So it's actually pretty advanced uh, SIMD hardware. Uh, and, and it's got a display processor, which is basically your average graphic cards that can draw dra triangles on screen with texture mapping, perspective correction, and everything. And then the same system on chip had like sound, video output, uh, DMA, and everything. Uh, the peak feed rate was about 30 megapixels per second. Yeah, the name of the processor were RCP, Reality Coprocessor, and, but the two big um, chips that programmers were handling were this RSP and RDP. Uh, so the general architecture, just to give you a quick idea, is this one. In this case, the designer went for a PC-like architecture. It's actually one of the few consoles that have like one central bank of RAM and everything accessed it. So basically the CPU, 
can get code from the cartridge into the RAM and then run it. And you can prepare the display list in RAM and the RSP will execute it or the RDP will execute it. The frame buffer is in RAM again. Yeah. The, fr yeah. the frame buffer is in RAM again. So basically you can draw um, using the graphic card, but also the, the CPU can draw in the frame buffer directly if they want. Maybe at the same time, why not? Maybe you, you just program the display list to draw the big image picture and then you have some text on top of the screen, you can write directly with the CPU while the GPU is drawing in the rest of the frame buffer. The microphone is not working. Yeah. <laughs> working again? Okay. Um, so everything is basically accessing the RAM at the same time, which actually was one of the main bottleneck uh, uh, for this console because uh, the RAM was really, really challenged with many different accesses uh, and the system bus was always locked, uh, always interlocked. Because I don't know if you know, but uh, when many different hardware um, devices must access the same RAM, there is basically hardware lock. So basically the RAM can provide only a fixed amount, amount of speed of reads and writes uh, and basically all the devices have a, a lock to synchronize. So basically the RAM was always locking and which means the CPU was constantly fighting uh, just to get an opcode from RAM because at the same time everybody wanted to write and read from there. So this was actually slowing down CPU a lot. Um, so let's see now some Rust code. How do you emulate a CPU? Uh, these are all, all, the, all the code that we write here that you will see here is actually real code uh, extracted from the emulator. So no, it's not like a pseudocode where I try to simplify things, which means it's maybe a little harder to read, but at the same time you get the feeling of the real thing. Uh, this is like the ma main interpreter loop. So how, th how, the, how does the main interpreter loop work? Well, the same, the, same of the, CPU, uh, the same way the CPU works. So first you fetch an opcode from memory. So what I did is I create an iterator in Rust uh, that iterates through, through memory providing opcodes. Uh, I will get back to it later. Let's skip. Uh, let's skip two lines here, which are MIPS details. Uh, you basically prepare to go to the next uh, program counter. Uh, each instruction is four bytes, 32 bits. So you basically prepare to jump to the next program counter, and then you know from you get this opcode, and you just you know interpret it. So this is actually the line that say, okay, please get this opcode, understand what it means. Uh, executed, ad, um, updated his CPU context, uh, the registers with new values, and get on. Then this is a tracer, uh, which is useful for debugging purposes, because I implemented the full interactive debugging with step-by-step -step and everything. So every instruction you have, you know, to have a debugging hook uh, where you can pause execution, uh, inspect the register, and everything. And then you basically go through the memory executing uh, until you know, a fixed amount of time that I uh, was mm, decided has been uh, elapsed and then you can exit. Um, so how do you, how do you decode this opcode? Well, an opcode like this one, this for instance is an add instruction which uh, basically uh, sums two registers and writes the destination into a third register, the RD register, is basically um, a bit encoding within the 32-bit words. So you basically need to you know, do some bit twiddling to extract uh, the different uh, parts of the opcode into different variables so that you can actually understand what it does. Um, this is a part of the op function that we were seeing before. Uh, that gets the CPU context, the opcode to execute, and the reference to the tracer, the debugger. Uh, let's keep a little bit. Okay, so at the end of the day, it basically extract a part of the opcode and match on it. And depending of, of the value, it does the execution. I try, interpreters are really hard to debug because if you, if you have a typo there, it's extremely hard to find it. So basically what I learned over time is that you want your interpreter to be extremely tight from, uh, 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 from uh, really a line of code point of view. If you get it extremely tight, you can see patterns in there. And if you see patterns, you can spot typos and bugs. Like you see, I try to, to keep every single opcode is just one line because it's 
one opcode is really simple. It does just one thing. It's adding two numbers together, shifting two numbers together. So you you, sh you don't need like 10 lines of code. If you do there, you don't see patterns anymore. Like, sorry, like for instance, this one is a shift, uh, logical shift left. Uh, so if you see here, what it's doing is from the opcode, extract one part, uh, shift left uh, by an amount written again in the opcode, uh, and write the destination into another register. So when when the interpreter is extremely tight, what it happens is that you can see these two lines. This is shift left and shift right. Uh, you can you know quickly spot if there is a typo there. The only difference is the shift direction. So this is actually really really important. It's not that I really like uh, condensed code. I actually prefer more relaxed approach when writing code. But for interpreters, I think it's the best way to make sure that you don't have bugs here. Um, one one thing I wanted to um, to focus on was uh, this uh, this part. Like you can see here, I'm matching the opcode and say zero four is this instruction. But I'm saying if uh, h sslv, and h is basically this architecture has opcode function. This is a closure I'm creating here just for the purpose of having you know a single character because otherwise the Rust format will split this in many different lines. Um, so uh, what I'm doing here, basically for every opcode, I'm actually calling a function that checks whether the architect, the current architecture has the opcode. Why? Because MIPS uh, is a family of CPUs. And we saw before that we have like one 64-bit CPU, the main one, and the 32-bit CPU in the RSP. So I need to emulate both the 64-bit CPU, which is the fourth generation, and the 32-bit CPU, which is the first generation. And they have a different instruction set. Actually, one is the superset of another. So what I want to do is to write a single interpreter, but make sure that only the uh, uh, instruction existing on that architecture are actually emulated. So uh, I did it with uh, some generic. Uh, I wrote this thread, which is very simple. It's basically MIPS architecture thread that says uh, that basically export a single associated function. Associated function are like static methods uh, in other language that say, okay, just give me one static string, so a literal, basically, and I will tell you if the opcode is available on this architecture or not. And how do you implement it? Well, like this, you know? So in this case, for instance, architecture first, the first generation, uh, is a big match that says, okay, these one are not available on this architecture, the rest is available. Like the default is available and everything is not available. And the nice thing is that since this is a trait uh, and the CPU is a generic over this trait uh, and this literal, these are literals and this function is in line always, uh, you see this function is an all, always. What it happens is that when you compile uh, all of these in release mode, basically all these function call disappear because everything is in line. And so basically you generate uh, a MIP score with only those instruction set, uh, only those lines. The other lines that are not available on that architecture are simply not compiled into the binary. So this basically allows for faster code execution because there is, you know, less matching to do, there are no function calls and everything. And this is a combination of both having a powerful generic system in Rust and a good optimizing compiler because part of this is a compile time trading stuff, part of this is having a good uh, inliner that can you know, resolve everything and remove code. Um, yeah, more examples. So uh, for CPU emulation, I would say that thread-based genericity is actually a good fit. Uh, it's actually a very good fit for writing a CPU interpreter. And uh, it's also very nice to have LLVM available as a backend because, you know, LLVM is very, very efficient. So you can, you know, write a very good high level of abstraction and everything is removed. Uh, almost everything. I found a few bugs, actually, but almost everything is removed. Um, one of the things that I disliked most um, is that in Rust, uh, um, basically in Rust, uh, for arithmetic, uh, the semantic is um, uh, like in debug mode, uh, if you add the uh, integer variable and the addition goes into overflow, in debugging you get a runtime panic, while in release uh, you get nothing. Basically, checks are, overflow checks are disabled, 
when you emulate a CPU, a CPU, you don't need, you don't want overflow checks because basically, when the CPU adds two numbers, Rust just needs to add the num those two numbers with wrapping uh, arithmetic. We don't need any kind of overflow set. But writing uh, wrapping co wrapping arithmetic in Rust uh, is not very easy. This is one possible approach, uh, which means that you see all these wrapping function calls within your CPU core. Or another one is to you is to use like a wrapping struct. Uh, there is a generic uh, for uh, for integers, but that one also has its own problems because you cannot like if you have a variable of wrapping u32 type, uh, you cannot add uh, a literal number to it. For instance, so you cannot write a plus one; it won't compile. You need to say a plus uh, wrapping u32 new one. So it's still you know very verbose approach. So actually what I do is I cheat for now. In uh, debug mode I release overflow checks. Uh, I actually don't like it because I actually need to release to um, disable them just for for the CPU. Right now I'm disabled them for the whole program. I think I can fix it with some cargo magic or I don't know. I, I didn't look into it yet. Uh, okay. So uh, let's see how we do emulate devices. Uh, as we saw before, there are many different devices and everything is connected to RAM, which means that we are basically in a very big mutable mess from a Rust point of view, because all these things will write to RAM. Uh, so all those things should have some kind of mutable reference to RAM to be able to read and write from it. And okay, you say, okay, what's the problem? I will just pass the RAM uh, around uh, to, to all the devices. So let's say you have a structure for the CPU, a structure that emulates the RSP, a structure that emulates the RSP, the RAM function, I will pass the RAM to them and then it's fixed. No, it's not. Because it's not just RAM that needs to be mutable referenced. For instance, CPU needs to read and write from RAM, the RSP needs to do it. The video interface need to read the frame buffer from it, but then the RSP can write to the video interface, uh, and the CPU can write to the RSP, and the RSP can write to the CPU. So basically, all the devices are interconnected, uh, and all of them uh, need to be able, you know, to trigger behavior into other devices. And like when you write the emulator in C on C++, you don't see this problem. You have, you know, I don't know, maybe the RSP structure will have. Uh, um, internally, we'll keep a copy of the pointer to the CPU, and then we'll just use it. But in Rust, uh, you cannot do that. You cannot have mutable reference everywhere. And so the first thing I tried was to use the ref cell everywhere, with, uh, with borrow mute everywhere. But then uh, I, I found another trouble, which is this one. I found, uh, I was like debugging a game where there was a CPU that was emulating uh, an opcode, the top code was triggering a DMA copy that was triggering uh, an RSP register that was triggering a CPU interrupt. And so there was like a reference loop. So with the ref cell, what happened is that you could, you go, uh, I was borrowing mute the DMA, that was borrowing mute the RSP, that was borrowing mute the CPU in the same stack frame, right? And this one was borrowing mute the CPU back again and then I got a runtime panic because I was already borrowing the CPU at the start. So it this one was actually a reference loop. So you cannot solve it with, uh, uh, with borrow moot. So this is one of the cases where I think uh, you just have to lose here because you, you, I don't think you can represent here from uh, this, uh, this architecture in Rust right now with the current feature of the borrow checker with uh, having one structure for devices. So you, have, you can have two different approaches. One is to drop uh, the idea of having one structure per devices, but personally, I cannot think of a way of writing an emulator without that. Uh, I think I'm short-sighted. Maybe I can you know, imagine a different way of writing the whole emulator core, but right now I cannot think of it. So what I did is was basically work around in the whole problem using singleton in thread local storages. So let's see. Uh, I defined this uh, trait called device, uh, which is, you know, a trait that all the different devices here uh, implement. The trait is a register, uh, as a register function to register into device map, a global device map, because you have one instance of the CPU per thread, I mean per, per process, one instance of the RSP per process, and so on. 
and then you, I have two associated functions to access the get and get mute, so the mutable and unmutable version from the global device map. So let's see, this is the device map. It's an hash map of devices uh, indexed by you know the name of the device, is uh, again a literal string, and holds a pin device. Um, I'm using pin here just because so that I can, you know, tell Rust that, that this uh, object is not moving in memory uh, because I locate it once and leave it there, so it's I never move it. Um, and registration is basically just inserting the device into this hash map. Um, and then I have the global device map, which is a thread local variable. And, and here, there is the single unsafe line that makes everything possible because I'm basically getting a mutable reference to this device map uh, and I need to, you know, return it uh, without keeping this reference cell locked. Uh, and this is basically unsafe. And so this is just the, the, the single unsafe line. So I basically, everywhere I can return a mutable reference to the device map and from there I can extract the device. So this sounds complex, but easy it is very easy because I just, you know, I had defined the, all the structs that emulate all the components. I initialize them with the constructor. They get a logger, okay, this is the detail. I just register them where? Into the only and unique global device map. And then when I need a device, I can do like this. So from every, everywhere in the code, I just, you know, for instance, here I'm in a function to render a frame. I don't know where it is in the emulator. And just say, okay, I need the VI. VI get moved to begin frame. Um, otherwise, I would have to have a VI mutable reference within this structure that will get back to the mess I was describing before. So in this case, yeah, of course it's unsafe. I cannot think of a way to make it safe. But at the same time, uh, once I design this approach, it's extremely easy to use, uh, which means that I can write the emulator very effortlessly. Okay. Uh, just a quick look at the memory map. As I said before, the CPU is accessing all these devices like GPUs, bank of memory. How does it do that? Uh, this is just, uh, again, a little primer on how uh, hardware works. Uh, usually CPU have memory map at the register. So basically they just write at magic addresses in RAM. Uh, Nowadays, we don't see this because everything is shielded by the kernel, right? The kernel, kernel programmers see these kind of things, but like in the user space, we just, you know, get a, some memory from an allocator, we get a pointer and we just write to it. But what happens is that at the physical level, uh, addresses are just, you know, uh, numbers into, into a range, a 32 bit range in this case, and all the different uh, uh, devices are connected to this range uh, in a specific address. Um, so, for instance, uh, if you were to program uh, uh, a video game on, on this hardware, what you would do is basically you would have, like, this is a C code, uh, you would have some uh, uh, hardware register defined like this in some header file that maybe your um, video game SDK was giving you. Uh, you would have, like, a register, hardware register pointing a fixed memory location because maybe this fixed memory location is within this address range and so talks to the GPU, and uh, in th this address, for instance, so can change the border color. And so I just, you know, write one, two, three to change different border colors. Uh, and then just by writing that register, the GPU knows that it needs to change the border color of the screen. Uh, this example is actually coming from the C64, uh, because this address number is the one that actually was changing the border color on the 64. And in basic, you could use the poke instruction to write uh, a value to a memory location. So if you if you write uh, one uh, to this location, the border goes white, uh, and if you word write two, the border goes green. This is what all the hardware works. Also, PC hardware is like this. It's just shielded by the by the um, kernel that hides and abstracts away these details from you. But when you write emulators, this is the way the uh, the CPU accesses all the different hardware components. So how do you emulate this again? You, the, the first basic implementation, this is pseudocode, so surely it won't compile. Um, the basic implementation will be, okay, I will write a read function in my CPU. I need to read from a certain address in memory and return a value. Okay, I can just match it, right? I can match on different ranges. 
and depending on the range, I will access a different, uh, a different device. So, so for instance, uh, uh, RAM, I can read uh, a word from RAM, a word from ROM, or if it's uh, a hardware component, I can just you know, read, uh, call a read function into that component that will implement it. So this is you know, the very basic approach, but um, it's pretty error prone because, for instance, this is a read 32-bit uh, instruction. You need also read 16-bit, uh, a read 8-bit, and then you need the write 32-bit, the write 16-bit. And so you don't want all those cost duplication with always the same address ranges everywhere. So what I actually prefer to do is to have like a declarative way where I can say, okay, this component is mapped in memory here, and then I have, uh, of course, uh, um, you know, a data structure that holds this mapping, and then I can say write uh, to the component at this address. I will look it up in the data structure and access it. Um, uh, this is implemented in uh, a class called bus, and uh, basically this is the way I do the mapping. So you see, this is the syntax we saw before to just get, in this case, a non-mutable reference to to all the different subsystems, and then same just the base address of this system, of each system, and then just mapping into the data structure. Uh, and by the way, to implement a device uh, we didn't see before, I wrote a procedural macro here. Uh, this say that the PI is a device in Big Endian mode, and basically every hardware register, I'm using this syntax to say where in memory it's um, within the, the PI this register is uh, allocated. For instance, this one is at offset eight within the bank. And then at this point, I can also add some few things like, I don't know, read, write, mask, or the other, you know, declarative information on how the register should be implemented, uh, which are really useful to write less code. And the procedural macro will actually generate all the access or for all the registers automatically. Um, I was saying uh, a data structure before. The data structure for uh, doing uh, this uh, declarative mapping is actually Radix tree. I won't go into Radix tree now, uh, but anyway, it's just a fast way for doing these kind of things. Uh, you just go through this tree that was built in memory in very efficient and memory efficient way, very cache friendly way, and you just go through it uh, and access the device at the end. Um, this is actually the code uh, of the Radix tree implementation. I actually checked for existing Radix tree implementation. Uh, there were a few available, but none of them was uh, cache efficient, was really uh, memory efficient because they were more, you know, super generic data structure. Uh, in this case, uh, looking up uh, a device for each and every read and write uh, instruction of the CPU is extremely um, uh, is extremely hot from a performance point of view. So I needed an extremely hot data structure. Uh, this one works. Uh, the only thing that it doesn't work is that since we don't have const generics in Rust, uh, we cannot parameterize it because I need to parameterize it by different uh, whatever. I, want, I don't want to explain it otherwise it takes too long. I need to parameterize it and uh, I cannot do that without const generics. So right now I'm just using you know global const so since I just need one instance of this, I don't care, just global const. And one I think is, th for instance, this loop is written in a way with this very, very C style for loop, because basically in this way, LLVM can unroll it uh, and can generate linear code. This is very important because again, I need to go through this and I don't want this to be a loop. I just want to have linear code that check this, then go this, then go here, and then extract the device. And I can do that with LLVM again using, uh, you know, very plain C code. LLVM can unroll this loop uh, in um, a consistent way, and at that point, the code is really, really efficient. Uh, when I write this kind of code, of course, the I always look at generated code, especially in this part, like not everywhere in the compiler, but I'm showing you the most internal parts in the CPU, and device uh, and the memory map is like the most critical part of the emulator from a performance point of view. And so those ones, I want to make sure that actually the generated code is the way you would write it in C with no abstraction whatsoever. So I just make sure that always that the generated performance is good. Um, how much time do I have?
Okay. Um, so uh, just just a quick look. The RSP, as I said before, uh, it's a, the CPU designed by Silicon uh, by Silicon um, Graphics, and internal internally it's, it's got a MIPS CPU and the SIMD instruction set I was discussing before, which is more powerful than SSA2. And the RSP program uh, are called microcode in N64 slangs. I'm actually not sure why this uh, word uh, was created because they are just you know simple programs. So the the way it works, uh, the way it works is basically the CPU has all these small programs which are like single mathematical functions like I don't know multiply these two matrices together or project this vertex onto the screen stuff like this there are these small programs and they're basically copied into the internal uh, static RAM of the RSP it's a, a zero weight state RAM internally to the RSP and then the CPU say okay take this microcode and run it and the RSP will just you know execute it uh, up to the end so it's really stateful so to speak so up to the break instruction which is the last one and the break instruction triggers a CPU interrupt to say okay I executed this so give me something more to do so this is very uh, easy architecture all of this was normally abstracted away from most of N64 programmers because it was not documented up until the very last few years of N64 life uh, most of the programmers were just using the Nintendo SDK with the OpenGL programming API. So they didn't know anything. They did GL begin, GL vertex, uh, and everything was fine. And then at some point, Nintendo was losing the battle with, uh, with the PlayStation. And so they released the internal documentation, the RSP, and say, okay, we wrote some mi microcode 10 years ago. Maybe you can do that better by writing your own uh, graphic engine, basically, with the RSP. This is documentation, go ahead. Uh, the problem is that the documentation was ex extremely bugged. So basically only a few uh, game developers managed to actually make games with custom RSP microcode. Which also means that back at the time, uh, we got uh, N64 emulators very early in the emulator history because most of them were actually not emulating the RSP at all. They were doing like this. When the CPU was, um, was triggering uh, a MRSP microcode, the emulator was just, you know, computing a hash of the microcode and say, oh, this hash is this one. Okay, I know you are multiplying two matrices together. Let me just emulate that. And so they were basically completely skipping RSP emulator, doing what they call the high-level emulation. And this allowed very, very early stage emulators com working with full games back in... Uh, maybe 1998, 1999, so very early stage emulators. And they were working quite well because it was also much faster to emulate like this. But this is actually not the way I like to do emulators because this is like cheating for emulator programmers. You actually need to you know, emulate the real hardware. So I think real programmers don't, don't do this. And so what you actually do is get this very buggy documentation with basically no details at all about overflows and everything about a seamed instruction set so this for instance is iterating on the vector register and doing some multiplication stuff uh, with yeah there is some clamp signed but you don't know what it is so it's really extremely undocumented and very buggy and you just write it uh, into ssc code I implemented it as SSC code because, of course, it's faster. Because otherwise, for each vector instruction, I need to do a for loop for each of every lane of the register. So I wrote the code using the Rust support for SSC intrinsics. Uh, so you write, you write all of this, and how can you make sure it works? Because you have like buggy documentation, and you have no idea what it's supposed to do. So basically, it's not going to work. This is also why it took very many years for emulators to actually, uh, N64 emulators to actually be able to, to do this. So what I actually did uh, to make sure it works uh, is testing. Like, you know, programmers should always test their own code. And this way, in this case, the only way to test it is to test it on the real hardware. So I bought this little gem, which is this uh, 64 drive uh, development tool. It's made by a single guy, I think he's in Japan, in Japan, but I'm not sure. And he basically built um, this thing by himself, by hand. It's like an FPGA board. It's like soldering by himself, by hand. 
uh, you have like a six to eight months lead time to get one because you know it doesn't care just month to one when you know it's not sunny outside so basically it takes a long long time and once eventually you get your end on this one you basically you can plug it and you can connect this very nice uh, USB cable to your computer and you can actually you know compile something here and run it on the console and get back the result and so in this way it's a little bit easier to test an emulator so what I do here is basically I created a golden test suite uh, I, I, I call golden test the test where I'm just checking that the results is the same of something that I know is correct like when you I don't know if you ever wrote crypto code in crypto code you have golden test like I wrote the some crypto algorithm and then I get the you know the standard uh, vector test like if I uh, execute MD5 over ABC I get this and so basically this is the same here what I'm doing is that basically this is a toml file describing uh, a test so like here for instance you can see the actually RSP code written in RSP assembly and then you have uh, in the same file you have actually the, the, the test vector that you want to feed to this small microcode here microcode here and then basically I wrote a simple program that will compile the TRSP run it on the console this is the compiled binary of the program the microcode and generates uh, the results into this binary file and then I commit everything into the git so basically I know that for this test this is the binary and this is the results that I expect and then I cargo test and uh, I execute my own uh, RSP interpreter and try to make sure that they match uh, what the real thing did basically and for instance if there is a there is a, an error I get a report like this I say okay I was emulating uh, this uh, vector multiplication on sign uh, this was the two numbers that was multiplying this is the expected result and this is the what I got from my emulator and yeah and from this I can you know debug and I can make sure that the emulator actually works um, I think I don't have any time anymore so okay uh, thank you very much